spiritual warfare strategies. And I wanted to bring this back. This was intentional. And uh, so we had, what, it's been, I think, a week or uh, whatever in between. So it's been two weeks ago that we had it. So we're going to continue to go forward. And some of what we're going to uh, read will be on the screen. You can feel free to follow on your Bible because I'm going to make a couple other references as well. When we talk about spiritual warfare strategies, we are talking about the what? Armor of, of God. All right? Are we, are we good? All right. All right. I don't want to get in the way, so I want to make sure everybody can, can see. So y'all get me out if I need to shift or if I need to move or do whatever uh, here while we're going through this. Because I might get excited and get in the way, but I don't mean to get in the way. Praise the Lord. All right? <laughs> we talked about some background information about the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, for any of you that do not know this, Ephesians is one of the prison epistles of Paul. What do I mean by that? That means that it was one of the letters he wrote to the church while he was in prison. For example, this very book that we're going into tonight, Ephesians, when you get to chapter 4, watch this. He says, I don't know if you ever thought about it. He says, I'm there for the prisoner. I'm not prison. I'm not in prison because I shot somebody. I stole from the bank. I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't commit a crime. I'm the prisoner of the Lord, which means he's locked up for the name of Jesus because of what he was doing toward the Lord. So Paul was able to be a blessing. Now this all right help us tonight. Sometimes the greatest time to be a blessing to somebody is when you're going through something. If you ever even study the life of Paul, you'll find out perhaps his greatest blessing was while he was going through his trials and afflictions. And I just want all of us to be encouraged as people of God. Sometimes when it looks like that you're really going through and you're getting a feeling of feeling defeated, that's the greatest time of victory. Because God is really trying to build a testimony out of your tests that you're going through. So hold on to that here tonight. So we're talking about some of this background information, and we've covered some of this already. <clears throat> The description of the armor of God is found in the New Testament book of Ephesians. Now, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare strategies and how important it is that we are aware of spiritual warfare. Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul in AD 60 to the followers of Jesus in the city of Ephesus. So we're talking about uh, nearly 30 years from the day of Pentecost, all right, nearly 30 years. So the church is basically uh, new, it's newly established, but at least we're right about 30 years old from the day of Pentecost, all right. Who was Paul? Paul, this name, and remember we covered this on last week. Uh, Paul's name also is in Hebrew, uh, it is Saul. So we don't want to make the mistake, we mean well. And you hear this a lot in Christendom. Uh, you know when he got converted, his name changed to Paul. Well, you have to understand in New Testament time, we just started the world and ministry was going more toward the Gentiles or Greeks. So, if you're talking uh, in Greek, then you go from Saul to Paul. So, that's the only thing that you're basically making reference to. Paul just uh, represents uh, his name in Greek. Uh, but Hebrew, notice when he's on the road, see, Lord knows who you really are. Amen. Sound like I just said something. Amen. Notice when the Lord appears to him on the master's road, what does he say? Oh, Saul, because really, by nationality, he is a Hebrew. So he's ministry in Greek culture, but I don't care where you go and who you mix with, look out somebody, the Lord knows exactly who you are. Praise the Lord. So just good information for us to be aware of. 
As a young man, he used to persecute followers of Jesus by having them arrested in jail. And then, of course, there was the conversion of Paul on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus. Paul was blinded by a bright light. Jesus spoke to him from heaven, told him to take his message to the Gentiles and the Jews. Is that right? As he began to minister, and he began to become that vessel for God, this is just a display of some of the areas as Paul began to minister. I hope everybody can see it back in the place. Holy God, both of them up on either side. So Paul finally becomes saved and he's, he's baptized. Paul went on three, three separate missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire. All right, again, that's another display of the map and uh, uh, how he's traveled that little red line going through there, just showing the, the way and the route in which he ministered. All right, it was his first missionary journey, it was the second, and this is his third missionary journey. Paul's ultimate goal was to reach Rome. So Paul's journey to Rome after his third missionary journey, Paul was arrested in the temple in Jerusalem and was brought before the Sanhedrin who had him sent to Caesarea. Now, over the next two years, and this brings us into the book of Ephesians, but over the next two years, Paul was brought before the governor of Phoenix, the governor of Festus, and King Agrippa. All right, so he had to really go uh, before people that were in high positions and rank. He had to go before government. He was being tried. The church took him to court. All right? I want to simplify so we understand. I said the church uh, took him to court or the religious world took him to court, not the true church. <clears throat> so again, there's some uh, background information now, Paul's taken to Rome during the time of Emperor Nero. So there were Roman emperors in succession. You can even study that uh, in basic history and read upon the time of Emperor. He was really a wicked guy. He was a low guy. He was responsible for persecuting a whole lot of people. I'm talking about low down. Uh, he took and had uh, women murdered and children cutting them out of bellies and uh, putting them in boiling pots and mutilations and all, all kind of stuff. We don't want to label that point, but uh, Paul was before some evil situations. It was all the working of Satan, and this is so important to the lesson here tonight. Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians while under house arrest in Rome. So once when you read in the Bible how Paul had long ago to Rome, once he's there, it is while he is put in the house because he was first in prison, he's lifted up out of the prison and put to a house but he's kept incarcerated. Alright? So that, but that incarceration that he was in, he, the Lord will give you favor in the worst kinds of situations. What did I just say? Well, y'all hold on to that. You, you, you go back to the Old Testament and remember the same thing happened to Joseph. That while Joseph was in prison, the Lord gave him favor. So that means as children of God, we don't have to feel like that we're without help and we're without favor. Another word for favor is grace, right? right. The grace of God is what? Favor, what else? Paul said when he had that thorn in his flesh, when God revealed to him when he prayed, he said, my grace is what? Y'all know what sufficient means, it's enough. So I mean, I don't care what you're going through, the grace of God is enough. This is all interesting stuff. We don't always pick this up uh, when we're going in certain biblical passages of scripture, but it's so important to understand because you gain a greater appreciation for what you read when you understand some of the background, all right? That's just a, a sculpture, basically, of the Emperor uh, Nero. Now, what about Ephesus? Because he's writing to believers in Ephesus. So it's good to understand some basic things about Ephesus. Ephesus 
was the center of worship for the goddess Diana. So Paul's writing to the believers that is having to confront idolatry. In other words, it's a book that relates and is relevant to where we are because when we deal with the world in which we live, the world is not altogether toward God. There are idols. There are people that give more allegiance to other things than God. I'm telling y'all, this lesson is important. This kind of information gives you an appreciation for the things that you read from the Word of God. So here again, in Ephesus, this was the center. Ephesus being one of the city, cities and provinces of Rome. All right? Rome was the capital, by the way, of the world at this time. Now, Whenever you read about Jesus and the first century church, uh, which is the New Testament, then you want to understand that when we speak of Rome, you're not just talking about a city. You're talking about a world power. Like Egypt, when the children of Israel were there, Egypt was a world power of the known world at that time. You go from Egypt to Assyria down to Babylon. I'm just trying to tell y'all, when you read the Bible about these places, these cities, it is not just a city and a casual place. In other words, God was revealing how powerful he was because the people of God had to endure affliction from the strongest force that there was in the world. And that's just like God. Here's a good point that everybody may want to remember to put your phone to silence. All right, I know y'all, We these things are so much a part of our society. I know we don't mean to, but sometimes when that happens, I just a little, little reminder for everybody, put your phone to silence so it don't cause any disturbance. All right? But it's, it's so important. There's at least six world powers in the Bible. If you don't know this, well, don't write this down. All right? There's Assyria. Let's see if I count them. And there's Egypt, rather, there's Assyria, there's Babylon, there's Greek, there's Persia, and there's Rome. Now, the Persian Empire really began to come into play, and we don't all the time uh, get deep in this book. It's the book of Esther, all right? But there's six world powers, and if we study it from Daniel... <laughs> Then, remember in Daniel, in the image, all the metals represented world power. Y'all remember that? We don't have to go too deep with that. We may pick that up as we go uh, a little bit further into the year. All right? This is so important. Why? Because in the end, in Revelation, Jesus Christ will finally crown what? King. Y'all missed that, didn't you? He will be crowned king of kings and lord of lords. See, when we read, what we got to have next is some understanding. Because you can't give God the praise like he's really due when you don't understand. So when I'm reading about the children of Israel being delivered from uh, a Pharaoh, that ain't small, y'all. Egypt controlled the world. When you got delivered out of Egypt, you had some showing up deliverance. You come down to uh, the time of Jonah and, and Hezekiah and Sennacherib over the Assyrians. See, when you read this, it's important to understand what you're reading. This is dealing with victory over a world power. And then Babylon, you know, you read about the Hebrew boys, you read of Daniel. This is not, they just down in a little area called Babylon, y'all. This is the world power. So when they got victory, that means they have overcome the world. Right. Lord have mercy. And then there's, 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 there's Persia, all right, and Queen Esther. Uh, that's not just a little beautiful story of a queen and what happened there. Are y'all understanding what my point is? So you, you, you learn your praise goes deeper because when your knowledge is deeper, your praise can go deeper. Right. Right. I said what I said, something. I said, when your knowledge is deeper, how many of y'all know that? When your knowledge is deeper concerning the Lord, then your praise is also deeper as well. So I'm telling y'all, because this is stuff that we read all the time, 
and the average person, even from church, does not really understand the essence of what they're even reading. Finally, you come down to Greek, all right, and you're coming down to the time of, of the uh, Gentile period of time, and you deal with Paul there in Greece, you deal with Jesus with Rome, so by the time you get to the New Testament, Rome is the last. It is the last world power, and Rome's influence still dominates the world today. Did y'all know that? Some of, some of y'all say you didn't know that. All right? Thank God for the Bible. Thank God for the Word of God. Thank God for church. So you can know some things that you don't. Rome today, let me give you just a fairness, and I won't go to be in that. But why is it that everybody bows to the Pope? Why does every nation Every head of state, why does everybody honor the Pope at Rome? I ain't got time to tell you tonight, but then that need to be a wake up. To understand Rome's influence, what is happening in the end time, and you got to understand it from Daniel, is that when you get down to the last world power, you get down to the end time, you deal with, first of all, uh, gold and silver in the image, right? And then you deal with what? Brass. Then you get down to iron. Then you deal with what? Iron mixed with clay. What is God revealing to us? He's showing us, first of all, devaluing of the world. Because the highest uh, metal uh, of the gold, the highest value of metals is gold. Then what? Silver. Then brass. Then iron. Now, iron, watch this. Iron is the strongest of all metals. Now, it don't have the highest value, but it is the strongest. So if we have time, we can talk a little about history to show you the impact and see how that really falls out. But when you get down to Rome, yes, how Jesus died. Who remembers? He died, what kind of crucifixion? What kind of crucifixion? A Roman crucifixion. Because now Rome is the strongest of all the metals. So even though it's late in history, Jesus, when he overcame, when he rose from the dead, that meant that he shall not conquer the world because iron, which is symbolizing Rome, is the strongest of every nation that have ever been in history. Is that all right? So you talk about giving God the praise, uh, which I now was I had that uh, that image of, of the uh, of the metals that and even the beast, but it may be coming later anyway because we need to know truth. Praise the Lord. So Paul is writing during the time of Roman rule and right to the end of the world. We're under Rome's influence right now. Every nation is under Rome's influence right now. And the effort to really create a global religion and a global economy and global world, that's in place right now. That's why that is the United Nations. All right? So I just want us to understand a lot of significance about what we're dealing with. So let's go further. <clears throat> So just a little bit about it. A large, famous temple was built for Diana, dedicated to her. That's the image of it. And you can see that if you look up this online. And if you read any books with history, you'll see this image of the goddess Diana. The area was a major port city of the what? Roman Empire. Businesses made money by selling what? Silver idols. Silver idols and souvenirs. Now, so when the saints got saved, this is the kind of stuff they had to overcome. Because they were confronted with our doctrine. Guess what? We are too. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right? This was the Agora or Marketplace, uh, in which was a commercial center of Ephesus. When Paul went there to preach about Jesus, people listened, and many became Christians. 
All right, some sorcerers who turned to Jesus came together and burned their magic books. All right, in other words, idolatry was prevalent, but through the power of the Holy Ghost. How many of y'all still believe that the power of the Holy Ghost is still strong enough to give us victory? Amen. Even when you're witnessing the folk that's caught up of the wise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Local silversmiths begin to worry that too many people will become Christians, which would hurt their business. The silversmiths and merchants started to ride against Paul and his co-workers. If you remember reading about that in Acts, if you're familiar, all right? Because they thought Paul and them was going to take away all of the gain that they were working for. The silversmiths demanded a hearing in the theater. The city clerk put down the riot and the church started in Ephesus. All right, read that in the book of Acts. All right, just give you a little bit of background. We covered some of this information. Now, so what did Paul write to the Ephesians? Paul praised God who made the world, loves us deeply, adopted us into his own family through Jesus, and gave us the what? Spirit. Holy Spirit. He said this was all a part of God's plan. You read in uh, the first chapter of Ephesians. All right, we're headed there now. We're going to talk about the whole armor. We're going to talk about spiritual warfare strategies. But he said, uh, Blessed be God, who have blessed us with all what? Spiritual. spiritual. Now hold the word spiritual. All right? According as he hath chosen us in him before what? Now, you, you want to make sure that you understand. I think that's uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. God did not have has to make choice of us. And any day that you feel uh, inferior because of anything, you need to go back and get in the Word so that you understand who you are. And when you feel like there ain't nobody concerned or think about you, you need to get back in the Word. Because right. human nature, sometimes you can have certain kind of days, certain kind of situations, appearance in your life. How many of y'all know you can feel like sometimes don't nobody care? Yes, sir. That's just human nature. So that's why, and we went to Joshua, if you want to be successful and prosper, even mentally, you got to stay in the Word so that you can know who you are. You got to let God talk to you and let you know, I chose you. And I, if I chose you, then I'm going to see you through. Every circumstance, you do have purpose. Come to tell everybody here tonight, as a child of God, you do have purpose. Right. You do have meaning as a child of God. I know you feel meaningless. We all do at times. Sometimes it's just the way life processes. It's, it's, it's all about ups and downs. But we need to know who we are in the Lord. He's chosen us in the end before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without him before him in love. He said that this was all a part of God's plan. He prayed that the believers would know God better and realize God's incredible power that raised Christ from the what? The dead. From the dead. Again, let's say about this. Silence your faults, please. All right. Now, he compared the ungodly life without Christ with a new godly life full of good news. And that entailed what? Blessings, peace, joy, inner strength because of who? Jesus. He told them how to become more full of love and forgiveness. Now, mind you, he's in prison, but he's telling them how to become more like Christ, full of love and forgiveness instead of being in darkness away from God. Finally, he called them all to put on the whole armor. Now, I went through this again to show you one thing, because always remember when you are reading, particularly what is called epistles, and epistles if anybody's in here that does not know, when you read at the title of each book in the epistle to, epistle simply means letter. Right. I, I think I don't, I won't ever forget. I was in a, a meeting that, and somebody was really trying to be really knowledgeable, appearing to be knowledgeable. Uh, the question was asked by the teacher and said that, uh, uh, can anybody tell me what an epistle is? So one brother stood up and said, Yes, he said, well, an epistle, you have apostles, so an epistle is an apostle's wife. <laughs> oh, 
So the teacher had to kindly correct him, and you know that was just an embarrassing moment for that individual. But but no probably if anybody's here that didn't know that, and when you see that word epistle, it simply means the letter of Paul. Now with that said, when you read Romans, when you read uh, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Thessalonians and all of those books, those are letters. Now, any of you that have ever wrote a letter or you've read a letter, you know that you don't have the essence of the letter because you read a page when there are several pages. In order to understand the essence of what the writer is saying, you have to have knowledge of the complete letter. That is a fundamental principle when it comes to scriptures. Paul is writing a letter, so he doesn't start in chapter 6, he starts in chapter number 1. And by the time he goes all the way through chapter number 6, and I'm just going to summarize this so we can move on. He has covered every basic area and aspect of our lives. That's why it's important to understand the essence of the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. So when you come to the word where he says finally, which we're going to read in just a moment. So Paul was calling them to put on the arm of God. Paul was in contact with the Roman palace guards and knew the kind of armor that they wore. The armor of God is an illustration of how to stand Firm against spiritual powers of darkness. All right, everybody read this. This is the Bible. You, you have your Bibles there. You can look at it on the screen. What's the scripture say? Finally, my brother, be what? Strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. I want everybody to look up there at the blue header, the armor of God. Now, here's what I want to say. And that's why I want to go a little bit deeper. The armor of God is not the only armor there is. All right. Can I say it again? The armor of God is not the only armor that there is. Without understanding that, we might be at risk for deceiving ourselves. Because when it, when it comes to, let me look this way for a minute because I want to tell you something. When it comes to getting victory in warfare, there are many different ways to fight. Do you remember, let me give you one example. you remember in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, I think it is, before you go into 17 with the showdown of with David and Goliath. You remember when he is before Saul, that Saul goes to get his armor. Right. Are y'all with me here? He goes to get his armor and he brings it to David. When David gets a hold of that armor, it's just something that don't feel right. It's something that does not resonate with him. And he said, I can't use this. I'm not accustomed to this. Every battle that I, I'm paraphrasing, every battle that I've always had, God's always fought it for me. I want you to, I want you to follow through with what I'm saying. So, uh, think about David before he faced Goliath. Who remembers uh, one of the victories that David got before Goliath? All right. He had a lion to come out against the flock that he was watching. Then he had another occasion, there was another kind of creature that came out, a bear. So he did not win the battle because of his own method of fighting. The Lord, when you go back and read those passages of scripture, the Lord delivered the lion and David testifies later. Y'all remember his testimony? The Lord delivered the lion, the Lord delivered the bear into my hand. So I do want to make the point even when we come all the way to the New Testament and when we read this verse of scripture, finding my brother be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor now of is a preposition so the essence here is not just putting on armor y'all. 
the emphasis must be placed and if he, you, it might help you sometimes to place the emphasis when you read it once you gain understanding I will underline of God it's not just putting on the armor because people can put on a lot of different kind of armor but you gotta put on the armor of God and the armor of God is described and I hope this will go a little deeper with us here tonight. The armor of God is described so it's not left for us to assume that we're properly armed. Praise the Lord. Alright, so let's go further here. So there is a picture uh, here, description of a Roman armor. Well, let me go back here a minute because the last part of the verse said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be what? Able to so the armor of God is the only way that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So whatever your thoughts are, whatever your feelings are, when it comes to spiritual warfare strategies, you cannot be successful, you cannot be victorious fighting any kind of way. Right? How do you fight against the opposition? Here's a question. How do you fight against the oppositions that you face today? That's the ultimate question. It's not what are you doing, it's how are you doing it. So everybody wants to overcome their battle. Amen? Amen. I, I asked that question. I said, everybody wants to overcome their battles, right? Yeah. So the question is, how are we dealing with it? How are you fighting? Praise the Lord. All right. Next verse says what? For we? Y'all know this one gets me every time. It needs to get all of us. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Against powers. Against powers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in, in high places. Now, note the word. What well, our lesson is tonight is so you stay in the flow of what we're really trying to bring out. Spiritual warfare strategies. Now go all the way back to chapter 1 and Paul said he has blessed us. You might miss this if you don't connect the dots. He has blessed us with what? All oh, all spiritual blessings. So you can't let your mind go carnal when you read that verse. Because you got to get to the sixth chapter to understand what he meant by spiritual blessings. The greatest blessings that you can have are spiritual blessings. Because the greatest fight you'll have is a spiritual fight. Lord have mercy. Praise the Lord. All right. So you're not fighting flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's some things that you can recognize as being wrong and out of order in a carnal way, but do you recognize spiritual wickedness? Amen. Spiritual wickedness. Now, let's look at the root word there. So I don't want y'all to uh, scratch your head too hard for that. What's the root word in spiritual? Spirit. So where you got to look out for wrong and evil and opposition to your well-being in the Lord is what's going on in your spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Spiritual wickedness is in high places. So it comes from high places in the spirit realm, from the spirit world, and it's designed to attack your spirit. So you've got to know how to spiritually fight in order to overcome spiritual forces. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go a little bit further. All right, let's read the next verse. It said, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now, who remembers the word withstand? What does that deal with? What's that mean? Withstand. There are two things there. Withstand and then having done all the stand. What do we mean when we talk about withstand? All right, we deal with stand against or another word. 
resist. All right, you've got to know how to resist. You've got to build up resistance. And in health, there's a such thing as building up resistance, fighting off what? Fighting off sickness, right? Fighting off disease. The body needs to build up what? Resistance. So there are certain things that the body needs in order for there to be resistance against cold, flu, disease, and so forth. Everybody with me so far? I want us to follow along with what's being said. And then he says, and having done all to stand. Now, when we deal with stand, the word stand here deals with position. Help me, Jesus. So now you can bring in the vision thing, the 2020 vision, divine conditioning and positioning for major transitions. Having done all to stand. All right. Next verse says what? All right, now we got a clear image here. We're going to dress him out. All right. Having done, uh, uh, stand therefore, having your. Now, you don't just stand. So this verse deals with how you stand. All right. You will not be standing if you don't learn how to stand. Praise the Lord. Stand therefore, what? Having your loins girded about with truth and having on the what? All right, let's dress out. Piece by piece. All right? So the first armor that is mentioned here is the girt or girdle or belt of truth as it is sometimes referred to in paraphrase edition. All right, that's the piece that you see right here. All right, because Paul was in prison and Roman soldiers, he was right around that, so God was talking to him. Do y'all know sometimes predicaments that you get in, God will use a situation that you're in to talk to you? Right. right. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will. He really will. Yes, All right. But he didn't stop at the learns, loins alone being heard about the truth. But he said, and have it on the what? <laughs> All right, you gotta cover your heart. Uh, um, Proverbs 4, I think it is. And around about 22, 23, somewhere, keep that heart right. Go there, somebody, right quick. I think yeah, I'm almost sure it's chapter 4, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4. 23, would you read that, Nigga Freeman? Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the what? Issues of life. Issues not of a particular thing. Your life depends upon how your heart is. Let's say amen. All right, so let us listen to what the Word of God is speaking to. And let me make a point here. Brothers and sisters, our hearts are so very important. It's so important that both the Old and the New Testament addresses it numerous times. I was thinking this evening, in just meditation and preparation for Bible class here this evening, Jeremiah prophecy, chapter 17, and the Lord gives Jeremiah this word. He said, the heart is what? Deceitful. And desperately, that gets me right there. You can't wait to be wrong. The, just human nature, the heart. Desperately wicked above. Your heart is a critical piece that all of us need to be concerned about because he said above all things. So when it comes to your heart, when it comes to my heart, we need to be very concerned and you need to take your heart seriously. I believe basically everybody in here knows that that's, that's definitely true, very naturally. But how much more true is this for us spiritually? The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked, above all things, that the question is challenging to us. Who can know it? But that was the Lord that said that to Cameron. Who can know it? 
Do you know your heart? Do you know your heart? Well, see, I know me. How many of y'all have surprised yourself? Every one of us in here. So that means we don't know ourselves like we what? Like we think we do. So the Lord come back and said, I the Lord. I'm the one that tried to heart. He said that I tried to reign, which means the mind and they go together. Because one is the doorway and one is the seat. All right? And the heart becomes basically symbolizing the seat of the operation of your life. All right? Where all your thoughts really settle. And that's where you make decisions and your determination based on. So the heart is the seat of your emotion. In other words, all of us have thoughts. Can I talk here just a minute? Yes, all of us got thoughts. But you can't entertain every thought. A thought, a thought may come across your mind, you gotta consider that at your door. You don't let everybody to come knocking at your door in your house. Amen. Look out somebody. Alright, so you gotta watch what you allow in your heart. Heart is the seat of your emotion, the seat of your thoughts. Alright? So keep thy heart in freedom in their force with all with all what? That's the verse that I admonish you. To underline, make that, highlight that so you know that verse. That's an admonition. The word keep is actually a military term. It means to guard. Keep thy heart. Guard your heart with all diligence, with every effort. Don't be careless with what you allow in your heart. Because out of it are the what? We got some issues, y'all. Right. And if we're not careful, just like with our natural hearts, it'll kill you. How many of y'all know some issues that you may have in your life if you don't watch how you handle it, it can kill you. All right, moving on. Praise the Lord. So you gotta have all that breastplate. All right, and then next verse says what? It's on the screen and in your Bible. Your feet shod with the what? Preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's put the shoes on. All right. Now, watch this one. Above all, next verse. Take, Take in the what? Shield of faith. Shield of faith. Where well, you shall be able to. Now, brothers and sisters, any one of these, I can take a lesson on by itself. But how important is faith? How many of you sometimes have a challenge with your faith? Amen. 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 Should be everybody's hand, right? Amen. Yeah. It's a part of the human struggle uh, to have to wrestle with faith. Matter of fact, that's why Paul, when he wrote to Timothy as a pastor, he said, fight the good fight of faith. Yeah, faith is something that you have to fight for. It don't just become so automatic in every instance of your life. You just, hmm, I got to faith. Sometimes you get a little shaky. You're just trying to reason. Oh, Lord. <sighs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? You start breathing hard. Right? You're trying to weigh some stuff out. You're trying to figure it out. I'm talking about human nature. Right? You're scared about certain things. I don't know how to go about this. What's going to happen? Right? right? So, so yeah, you got to fight. So this is part of the armor. Above. Now watch that word. Why does he say above all? All right, because in fighting, there are two things to understand. All right? It's kind of similar in sports. There are two things to understand in order to win. You've not only got to be offensive, which means you take the fight, mm -hmm. but you've got to be defensive. All right? So now we need both offense and defense as strategy. We're talking about spiritual warfare strategies. You're not going to win with no protection when we talk about faith. Now write this down if you're taking note. But faith is your protection. Faith ain't just some casual feeling you need to have toward God. You got to understand faith in biblical context. Faith is your protection. 
So when it comes to faith, God is giving you an illustration so that you understand the impact of faith and the importance of faith in your life. Faith has to be looked upon as a child of God as a shield. And you use a shield to protect you from what's coming at you. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody give God a praise again tonight. So that means that you do not take a casual attitude when it comes to where your faith is or is not. Now, sometimes we can find ourselves not having faith. And sometimes we can find ourselves having only little faith. Aren't y'all mad for the Bible? The Lord knows that we struggle like that. When he was with the disciples, they were out there on the boat and the, uh, the winds arose on the sea. Uh, so many different lessons in the scripture talk to us about faith. And uh, y'all know when they woke him up, and he was in the hiding part of the ship and he comes out and he rebukes uh, the wind and the sea and they become a calm. And the Lord says to them, oh, ye. What happened? And then there's another occasion where Jesus was with them and, and he asked him, he said, how is it that you have no faith? Now, I, I appreciate the word of God for that because as I look back in my life, and all, basically all of us probably can say this, there have been times in my life that I would say I just had little faith. Right. And it wasn't as strong as it needed to be. I had some, but it wasn't as strong as it needed to be. But there's other times that I'd be honest, I didn't have no faith. I ain't had no faith. But now, there's another instance in the scripture. Uh, the man has a boy that's lunatic. And the Lord, when he finally confronts the man, and the man tells Jesus about the situation, mm -hmm. and then he said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. Who remembers what the man said? That man started a prayer meeting. Yep. He yep. said, what? Yep. Lord, yep. I believe, yep. but... Yep. So watch this. I, I'm, I'm trying to help us get this point about the whole army here. So listen. You never take a casual attitude. I don't care if it's little faith or no faith. The good news, if it's little or if it's no faith at all, the good thing is you pray. But the worst thing to do when your faith is not where it needs to be is to do nothing. You know why? Because you're in warfare. When you under attack, you can afford to do, you can't afford rather to do nothing. Am I having anybody here, All right? You cannot ever in your life, this is basically an illustration, all right? This is something to help us to get the picture, to get the essence of how important it is. Every piece of armor is a picture that God is painting to help us to understand of what all is important to help us to get victory in our life. Everybody say victory. victory. Say it again. Victory. victory. All of us need to understand what it takes to get victory. See, and God is so loving to us, he's not leaving it to us to have to figure out how can I get victory. What he's telling us, put on the whole arm of God. So it's broken down, so we ain't got to figure what that is. Or I'm just putting on the whole arm of God. What's in your head when you say that? Right. Y'all get the point? Really, do you have an understanding of that? So we have to slow down sometime and look at it piece by piece, piece by piece, like getting dressed. We got to understand what needs to be covered in our lives. Right. Amen? Amen. The armor, write this down if you take a note, the armor of God is a covering for me. The armor of God. The armor of God is my war clothes. Never fight without your armor. 
You got to have your wall close. We used to sing that song. Some of y'all been in church a long time. We would crank up saying, I'm a soldier. And every now and then we we crank that other part. I said, I got my wall clothes on. I'll be honest with y'all. Especially growing up, I'm just saying, I didn't know what you're talking about. I'm just being honest. I don't think I'm the only one, though. It just sounded good, right? Got my wall clothes on. In the army of the Lord, and a bit more got nothing on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, but the, the armor of God are your war clothes. Praise the Lord. All right, so above all, notice that when we get to this, let's, let's get the shield up. Taking the shield of faith. Now, you're going to notice, watch this, everybody. You're going to notice when it comes to spiritual victory, you got to participate in the victory that you need from God. Right. God is not going to just come down and give you victory. <gasps> right, sir. He's not this. No, he's not. Study it from the Old Testament. Look at battles and wars and how they evolve. There's always something the people of God have to do. The thing I want to tell us is sometimes if we're challenged for victory, the question there is to be asked, have I done my part? Amen. All right. Have I done what God has instructed me to do in order to have the victory? Amen. That becomes all of our challenge. Have I done what I'm supposed to do? All right, so the shield, now I want you to know this, uh, I encourage you to even do this to help it stick out like it needs to. He said, above all, when it comes to this piece, faith is your shield. You need to make sure, even when you got the other pieces of armor on, above all, make sure you got this. You don't know what's coming at you. Even if you don't feel like you got enough strength to sway the sword yet. Above all, make sure you got this. Above all, take the shield of faith. Watch this. Well, when you shall be able to quench what? All right, let's go a little bit further. Take the helmet of what? Salvation. And? Which is the what? All right, so here's the thing that I want to remind all of us. Now, I've been guilty of it in my walk with God, and I believe about 99 percent, point nine percent, uh, that the rest of us be guilty of this too. Sometimes we give ourselves credit that we're doing some things. I've done this and I've done that. I want us to understand victory from the word of God. Victory according to the word of the Lord is not to put on some armor. Victory according to the word of God is put on the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to stand. Brother Reggie, you got your eyes fast and firm now. He said, when we read it earlier, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, if you're going to stand against the tricks, that's what wiles mean, the cutting craftiness of Satan, you're not going to be able to do that because you put on a piece of armor. Sometimes we want to run and skip because maybe a thing here we've done right. Some things you've got to understand being made complete in God. In order to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the words that put on the whole armor, the whole armor. Because if you only put a piece, while you might be, be strong over here at this point, you've got another piece of your life uncovered, that means the devil still got a way in at you. Right. Amen. Now watch the scripture in another place. It says in the same book of Ephesians. I told y'all this one letter. I think it's the fourth chapter. Need the give place to the devil. And one of the ways that you give place to the devil is when you don't put on the whole armor of God. That means you're what? Vulnerable. Exposed. Sometimes in the church, people get shot, wounded by the devil because they are too exposed. They're too uncovered. All right? Lord, how time flies when you have it. Oh. 
There's the helmet, y'all. Got to put it on. Now notice that's covering the head. Y'all notice that? So sometimes this illustrates the point that God's trying to get across to us. And then, not only take the helmet of salvation, then he said, and the sword of the Spirit. Sometimes I think people miss this. He didn't just say, and take the sword. He said, take the sword of the Spirit. <clears throat> so see, when you deal with the word of God, which is the sword, it don't work without the Spirit. Amen. They do not work in contradiction to one another. I ain't got time to label that point that I need to come back and deal with that because that's why a lot of people fall in there too because we're trying to be strong in the Lord claiming the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. But then there's no word. And then we're trying to say we got the word but we ain't really in the spirit, we're in the flesh. Right. I ain't got time to talk about that tonight. Moving on. All right. Here's another part of the army. He said praying always with all prayer, supplication, in the spirit and watch there too with all perseverance supplication alright now here's another part that we missed he didn't say just pray what did he say praying what praying what I already prayed uh oh now I wonder why we ain't got victory because he didn't say pray. He said pray ye always. You see, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. Every word. And words got power, y'all. And you'd be surprised how removing a word can change the whole context. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand what is being implied here. Not I pray about it. He said you got to learn how to develop a lifestyle of praying. Amen. Uh oh y'all. Can I help y'all? Y'all know we just don't have to get through. But watch this. Watch this. Can I help y'all tonight? What God is teaching us is you don't just fight when you see something coming. You got to remain prepared to fight. You don't pray because a problem happened today. And that's the only time that God becomes relevant. Every time something happens. Now all of a sudden that God is important to talk to. And sometimes not only God then is important to ask the saints now. How come you ain't into that on a regular basis? I want us to understand sometimes why we don't get victory because you got to do completely what God said. I already prayed, but I just prayed to the Lord about it. But don't seem like nothing has happened. The reason why is he didn't say pray about it. He said pray always. Amen. Develop a lifestyle of prayer. All right, so write this down. Make it up to yourself. I need to develop a lifestyle of praying. I went to prayer meeting today. <clears throat> I prayed about something today. No, what is your prayer life like? Praying always with all prayer and supplication. That means you got to learn how to be specific with God. Stop all them general prayers and then giving yourself credit for praying. Because sometimes I'm only praying out of the other country. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Need your help today. Amen. <laughs> watch it. Watch it. Amen. Supplication means you need to be specific with God. Right. You don't want nobody in conversation with you and they just talking around in circles. Right, tell tell me, what, what do you mean? What, what are you saying? You're not concentrating when you ain't specific with God. Amen. When you've been in church for a while, you can pray without thinking. Amen. I'm talking honesty now, y'all. You got to be careful when you pray. He said praying always. What? With all prayer and... All right. You got to make sure that you are complete.
lead me into the prayer. Praying with all prayer and supplication in the what? Spirit. Rhonda. Shonda. No, that ain't what he talking about, Rhonda and Shonda. No, he ain't talking about that. We have reduced the Holy Ghost down to just a tongue. I'm not suggesting that when you pray, you may not speak with tongue. There's a place for it. But if you limit praying in the spirit to tongues, you have missed the whole essence. When you study what it means to walk in the spirit, live in the spirit, pray in the spirit, he ain't talking about tongues. God himself in the spirit, he means get out of the flesh. It means get in the will of God. Praise the Lord. Praying in the spirit and watching there until, uh oh, that's a word, that's a part of spiritual victory. Watching there until with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praise the Lord. Now, there's a description of the armor, there's historical background, application, biblical passages. Uh, and there's some other parts here that we want to get to, but let me just give you a little bit of this. The belt of truth was named after the leather belt with an apron that hung in front of the Roman soldiers. What? We talk about vital organs now and lower abdomen. All right? So that those straps that hung down from the soldier was to help protect vital organs. Can I go further? The devil is intent from keeping saints from reproducing. That that's so. That that's so. You gotta protect the vital organs. Small brass plates were attached to the apron to provide the greatest possible protection. When preparing for battle, the belt would have been the first piece of protective equipment put on by a soldier. Jesus said, "If you continue in my word, let me see if I can help y'all right quick. Very fundamental." If you take my word, you'll be my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall. Amen. How important is it to know truth? Praise the Lord. Amen. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? He said, thy word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. The belt was used to Watch this. Tie up garments so they would not get in the way while fighting. You need truth is shown as the girdle. You need truth to hold everything else about the insane together in your life. Because when you get ready to fight, you ain't going to fight with what's false. You're going to have to fight according to what's right. Amen. I ain't got time. Mm. Somebody tell the Lord thank you. Now the truth they hung closely to the soldier and shielded some of the most vulnerable areas of his body. All right? The belt prepares one to be ready for action. The call to have your loins heard about when truth is a call to be what? All right. Being prepared to fight. We got to fight, but you ain't going to win because you got to fight. You're only going to win if you're prepared to fight. Call to have your loins heard about again with truth is a call to be prepared. Christians always need to be ready to defend themselves against the powers of darkness, not to be caught unaware. God help us to be prepared. Amen. You can be prepared in every circumstance by making certain that you are a person of truth. This includes knowing what? <laughs> All right, knowing the good news about Jesus and explaining why you believe in him. So you got to talk about it. Here you go back, back to talking about it again. You got to put the word in your mouth. Somebody, and putting the word in your mouth is not just for you. Amen. All right, sir. The more you proclaim truth to others, that means the devil loses the fight. Amen. That means that he, he's losing influence. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Living as a person of integrity, that's what this means. As someone who is what? Honest, if Jesus said I'm the way, the truth, and the life, we are as part of this, we got to be people of truth. Amen. People of integrity. Amen. God will fight for you. 
Amen. Ain't that time, y'all. God will fight for you when you are a person of truth. I know the truth. I believe the truth. I live a life of truth. That's how I'm girded. Praise the Lord. Truth. That's the point. It is significant that the belt of truth clung to the most vulnerable part of the soldier's body. The belt of truth reminds contemporary Christians that God calls us to be truthful at the deepest and most intimate levels of our lives. Wow. King David wrote, Surely you desire truth in the what? Amen. Inward parts, all right? Sanctify the Lord God, is what the scripture said, in your what? And ready always to give what? Answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with what? But what saith it? Come on, help me read because the word is what? Even in thy. Oh, and you go again with the word in your mouth. Are y'all getting this tonight? You got to put the word in your mouth, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is what? Word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be what? Saved. All right. For with the heart man what? And with the mouth. All right. Thy word is true. That's the point here. I was going over these scriptures here to show making the point about truth. All right. These are other uh, references of scripture, if you care to just note some of these passages of scripture that help us. Again, the point is the word, the word, the word. What is true? Thy word is true. Sanctify them. Jesus prayed through thy truth. And then the statement right behind that is thy word is true. Don't have to struggle with truth. Thy word is true. Let God be true, let every man be alive, even if it's you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, these important passages, scripture to know. All right, give me about two more minutes, and we'll get a couple of other points for tonight. Is this helping anybody tonight? Amen. All right, this is not too important here. Greek or Latin term here for truth, study, letter, belt, war, by Roman soldiers. Again, just make the point. All right, the breastplate of righteousness. All right, after buckling the belt around the waist, Roman soldier would have fastened the breastplate around his what? His chest. All right, there again is a description. There are two types of breastplates. The first type of breastplate was fashioned by joining several broad curved metal bands together using like thongs, all right, which is what you see the silver in the middle. All right, going down. Second type of breastplate was a type of chain mail constructed by linking small metal rings together until they formed a vest. Those were two different types of breastplates worn by Roman soldiers. Purpose of both types of armor was the same. That was what? There are some vital parts to our lives, so when we're told to put on the breastplate, of righteousness, it is vital. It is vital. Right? If a soldier failed to wear his breastplate, an arrow could what? Easily reach the soldier's chest, piercing his what? What's the lungs for, y'all? So you want to be able to breathe, learn how to live right. You want to stop stressing, y'all? Loud and everything to get to you. That enemy is waiting. I ain't got time tonight, y'all. The enemy is waiting to get to us. That's just learn to live right so you can breathe. Right. Protect the lungs. Uh, protect your vital organs by learning to live right. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. You don't have to let everything get to you, but you ain't going to be able to survive all that comes against you on your own. It's going to get you. You can't sleep, you're gonna hyperventilate. Everything is stressing you. You're gonna think you need to take value. I can't sleep and can't think and can't operate. God help us to put on the breastplate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Right? The prophet Isaiah says that the Lord puts on the righteousness as a breastplate. So what you think we got to do? Right. 
Isaiah also says that the Lord goes to battle against injustice and corruption, restoring peace and order to the what? The to the land. Isaiah 59. Praise the Lord. Talk about righteousness. See, God will motivate you. Righteousness is not just a mere instruction. What you got to do, what you can't can do. Righteousness is a breastplate. Remember again, holistically, the whole armor is a covering. It's protection. I'm living right because I want victory. Yeah. Because somebody said I got to do this or that. Right. Wrong mindset. Wrong mindset. God offers his own righteousness to every believer in Christ. Righteousness is not something that anyone can gain by doing good deeds. It comes from faith in Jesus Christ. And two references here, Titus 3 and 5, Philippians 3 and 9. Praise the Lord. Again, there it is, the breastplate. All right. I'm going to stop with this one here as soon as we're done with this, and we'll pick up next week. God will put it on the breastplate of righteousness. Means believing in Jesus and his righteousness, not our own. And these are good passages of scripture that help you understand because you've heard me teach this. There is a righteousness not belonging to God. Romans chapter 10, in fact, would tell us that Israel's mistake was made because they went about to establish their own righteousness and had not submitted themselves to the what? Righteousness of God. All right? Standing firm against injustice and corruption. Uh, these are good passages of Scripture, Leviticus 19, Hebrews 1 and 9. We're talking about the way that we learn righteousness. We've got to make it a part of our lives. Knowing that God promises his protection against the heroes, or, or not heroes, the forces of evil, uh, for those who have faith in Jesus. Should have on my lesson, but I know. <coughs> Second Thessalonians 3 and 3. Only oh, right here. I'm not done anyway. Wait until now for the phone. Now I can see. Watch this. Blessed are they which what? We close it out, y'all. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for what? God ain't gonna force righteousness on you. In other words, God ain't gonna throw no protection over your heart. You gotta want to be right. And or, see, the only way that you can really begin to be right, you gotta first of all want to be right, and secondly, you gotta do right. Yes. Gotta want to be right. Everybody say, gotta want to be right. And then you gotta do right in order to be right. All right, that's the way it works. All right? Well, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. I'm talking about the gospel in Romans chapter 1. There is righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall what? By faith. Lord have mercy. Ain't got time for that one. The just shall L-I-V-E by what? Faith. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and up on all them that believe for there is no difference. Praise the Lord. Breastplate with the devil to come in your chest, come in your heart. Breastplate composed of several curved metals uh, bands fashioned together with leather thongs. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. So we'll pick up going next after the breastplate. Y'all got your lap open? You know what the next piece is? The feet shot. So we're going to talk about evangelism. You know what I found out, Sister Serena? A lot of people take a casual attitude toward evangelism because we don't see that as being necessary to give us victory and spiritual warfare. I want you to know that when you have your feet ready to spread the gospel, you notice he said, go, which means you got to use your feet. He said, go into all the world. You see, you and I have to understand that when we're involved in the work of the Lord, God is fighting our battle. I wonder if we really got busy for the Lord, what would we see God do with our situation? Everybody clap your hand and give God praise here tonight. And God, for the word of the Lord here 
on this evening and before.